Well, good evening. It's good to see everyone this evening. Uh, fall has definitely arrived. Hope you're all ready for it and hopefully enjoying it. We continue tonight with our study from the book of James. Tonight we want to look at, in particular, the subject of bridle your tongue. You remember that as we're looking at this study of James, that James is writing to Jewish Christians. He is addressing cultural characteristics of the Jews that have been such for centuries. Their tongue was one that had been a problem for a long time. Jesus would deal with that when in his generation. You'll remember that Moses, his brother and his sister, how that they complained against him. They murmured against him. Why, can't we, why shouldn't we be the leaders of the people? Remember the people complained about, we don't have anything to eat. We don't have anything to drink. They were complaining all of the time. They were complaining against each other. So what we're looking at tonight was something that was really culturally acceptable among the Jews. This is just the way they were. Uh, I mentioned earlier this week, I think on Sunday, how many of you have seen the, the picture Fiddler on the Roof? And there was a few of you who had. And Debbie said, you didn't explain why you talked about that. But the main character, the father of, uh, in, in the movie, was they, they were not a rich people. They were uh, just common folks, you know, maybe, maybe lower middle class, I don't know. But one of the songs that he sang, if I were a rich man, would that upset, upset some great plan of God, you know. Uh, that was characteristic of how that the Jews were all the time complaining about things. Regardless of how good they might have had it, they were always saying, well, this is what we don't have. James is going to address those things in this portion of the epistle that we're looking at tonight. In fact, in a couple of different places. In chapter 1 and verses 19 through 26, we've noticed a few of these verses before in uh, our previous studies, but we come back to these. These things blend together. And so he says, So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear. Now notice, slow to speak. Be swift to hear the word of God. Be slow to speak. Be slow to get angry with God. Be slow to question God. Be swift to hear God. We talked about this a little bit. Uh, how that Nicodemus came to Jesus by night and he said, I know you're a teacher come from God because no one can do the miracles that you're doing except God be with him. And, and so Jesus said, you must be born again. What was the first thing he did? How do you do that? How do you go back into your mother's womb? Instead of considering, well, maybe he's going to explain this to me. There's other incidences in, in the life of Jesus where that same principle comes up. But let every man be slow to speak, slow to wrath. Don't get angry with God. For the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your soul. Be swift to hear the word of God. Implant it in your heart. It's able to save your soul. You and I cannot be saved without the direction of the word of God. But be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourselves. If we hear God's word but we don't do what we hear from God's word, we're just deceiving ourselves. Well, I know what God wants me to do. Are you doing it? No, I'm not doing it. I intend to do it someday. Someday I, I will, but I'm not performing his will right now. But I know what he wants me to do. That's not what saves us. What saves us is hearing it, trusting it, and obeying it, doing it. And so he says, 
For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. He observes himself, he goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who does, who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. This is an illustration. And we can understand the illustration as he's given it to us here that uh, we might look into a mirror and we might see things there that we like or dislike, but we go away from the mirror and we forget what we look like. But here's another way to explain, to make the same explanation. That hearing without doing seldom results in learning and developing a skill. That's what he's been talking about. Be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to argue with God, and quick to practice the things that we put in, that, that God has taught us and we've implanted into our heart. He's saying, but now look, if you were trying to develop a skill, you might get a book and read it, so, well, this, this, is, this is what you do. And you might even say this is what you do first, this is what you do second. Or you might have somebody teaching you. You might be an apprentice, and they show you what to do. And they might even stand there and, and with you as you go through each step of it. And you're kind of learning that. And you're, you know what to do, but you really don't know what to do until you start doing it. Right? You're familiar with that. Ladies, when you get a, a recipe and you say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make this, and you are, but the first time you do it, how's it usually go? Not as good as the 10th time you do it, right? Guys are the same way. They go to build something. Uh, maybe it's the first time you change the oil on your new car. All cars are different. And the first time you do it, you learn where things are and, it, you know, you get around it, you get it done. Second time you do it, you know right where to go, what to do, where to lay this, where to lay that. It goes quicker. That's what he's saying here. Look into it. Be a hearer and a doer. Because if we just hear, we might know but we don't really know until we do it. You see that? Okay. So if anyone among you seems, thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, this one deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless. Now notice, let everyone be slow to speak. Lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness because that's what God teaches us to do. Be swift to hear that and be quick to act upon that. Be doers of the word and not hearers only. And so as we hear God's word, are we going to learn what he wants us to do? Yes. But now notice, if anyone among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, this one's religion is useless. The religious person who scrupulously observes the tenets of religion in worship, organization, the work of the church, and so forth, but fails to control their tongue when they know the word of God teaches them to do so, deceives their own heart. They have failed to be a doer of God's word and a practitioner of his will. They are out of harmony with the characteristics of holiness and godliness. They have hidden his light under a basket of uncharacteristic speech for one who professes godliness. That's what he's saying. Anyone who thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue deceives his own heart. This one's religion is useless. As we read through the epistle of James, it becomes clear that the brethren he is addressing have to learn to practice the self-control 
that is necessary in order to be a faithful representative of the Heavenly Father and their Savior. The fact that we are charged for failing to bridle our tongue necessarily infers that we have the ability to do so. If you do not bridle your tongue, you're going to be held accountable for it. What's that say to you? It says you can. You can bridle your tongue. We must bridle our tongue is actually what he's saying here because otherwise our religion is, look at it over there, our religion is useless. The New King James Version says, the King James Version says vain. Vain means empty. It's, it's useless. Everything else that you've done, baptize for the remission of your sins, read the Bible every day, attend every worship service, every Bible study, worship in spirit and in truth. Ever, all of that means nothing. If you do not bridle your tongue every day. Do you think he means that? Are you going to argue with that? This one's religion is useless. This is important. And if you were raised around people that were all the time murmuring, complaining, if you were raised around people who were all the time cursing and using swear words, to where you've adapted that into your vocabulary without even thinking about it, and you know the Word of God teaches you not to speak that way, we cannot use the excuse, well, that's just the way I am, and I can't help it. It's the environment that I was raised in. Everybody around me talks that way. I just can't help it. James says you can. The Holy Spirit led James to teach us that you can help it. And if you profess to be a follower of Christ, and you're a murmurer and a complainer, you are one who uses swear words. You're not letting the light of Christ be seen in you. You are hiding that light under a basket of your language and of your speech pattern. So we need to take this very seriously, as they needed to take it very seriously. We turn over to chapter 3 of James. It says, My brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. What does a teacher do? He talks. <laughs> he teaches. He needs to be sure that he's teaching the truth. He's not teaching an opinion he needs to be teaching, if any man speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God, as God has spoken in his word. Paul wrote to the evangelist Timothy in 1 Timothy 1, verses 5 through 7, says the purpose for the commandment, the reason God gave us these commandments, is to teach us to love, to do so from a pure heart, from a good conscience, and from sincere from genuine faith, hearing what God says, trusting what God says, doing what God says, not practicing opinion. Now notice, from which some of you have strayed and have turned aside to idle talk. We've got a lot of that going on today in the religious world in general, and sad to say, in the pulpits of the Church of Christ. That guys are out to, to make a reputation for themselves. They like to entertain. People like to hear stories, and they like to hear illustrations, and there's more stories, and there's more illustration than there is scripture and, and teaching. But people like that. 
And so they give people what they like. There are also people who like to hear the word of God and like to hear it explained and like to be reproved and corrected and instructed in righteousness. And I found that there's uh, people only set for so long. And I just don't have time <laughs> for all the stories and the illustrations. But some have turned aside from the scriptures and have turned aside to idle talk. If you're going to be a teacher, be careful what you're teaching. Be careful what you're saying. Be careful what, what you're spending your time that's allotted to you doing. They desire to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor the things which they affirm. Well, they want to be a teacher and they want to be heard. They want to teach the word of God, but they don't know what the word of God says. They might read it, but they don't understand it. They don't spend the time to rightly divide the word of truth. They'll pick out a scripture, read a scripture, and go off on their idle talk. Let not many of you be teachers, knowing that teachers will receive the stricter judgment. You're responsible for what you teach. And the hearers are responsible for what they hear. You're, able, you're supposed to be able to discern whether you're hearing the word of God or you're hearing idle talk. He goes on to say, for we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle the whole body. That's a very encouraging verse. Because first of all, we know that James has just told us that God expects us to bridle our tongue that we have the ability to bridle our tongue. Didn't say it was easy. It takes self-control. But what he's saying here is that if we will control our tongue, if we will practice the self-discipline it takes to control our tongue, he says you can apply that same principle of self-discipline to everything. We might offend in many things. We all stumble in many things. But if you can practice the self-control to bridle your tongue, you can practice that self-control over all of those other things as well. I didn't want to do that. How do you back this thing? There we go. Okay, so gives an illustration. Indeed, we put bits in horses' mouses, in the mouses, <laughs> mouths. We put bits in horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn their whole body. Look also at ships. Although they are so large and are driven by fierce winds, they are turned by very small rudders wherever the pilot desires. Even so, the tongue is a little member of the body, but it boasts great things. See how great a forest a little fire kindles? And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set in our members that it defiles the whole body and it sets on fire the course of nature. And it is set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird and reptile and creature of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by mankind. And so he gives all of these examples of large, you know, a horse is a large animal, weighs a thousand pounds or more, depending on the horse. But you just take a, a small little metal bit and you put it in their mouth and they'll go wherever you indicate you want them to go. You've got a large ship. And you can tell that ship where to go with just a small rudder on the back of it. 
you start a little fire and it can burn most of California away. We've seen those news stories, haven't we? And they can get out of hand just so quickly. And so also, he says, the same is also true of our tongue. It's a small member of our body. We don't even see our tongue. But we can change the course of a person's outlook on life in a very short amount of time, for good or for bad. He says, but the tongue no man can tame. What does he mean by that? He means no man can tame your tongue. We know that we can bridle our tongue because he's told us to bridle our tongue. If we couldn't bridle our tongue, he wouldn't be be saying here that your, your tongue couldn't be bridled. Your tongue can be bridled, but I can't bridle your tongue. God can't bridle your tongue. It's your tongue. I can put a bit in a horse's mouth. He might not want to go where I want to go, but when I put that bit in his mouth, he's going where I tell him to go. I put a rudder on a, on a boat, and the forces of nature might want to send that boat one way or another, but when I put that rudder on there, it's going where I want it to go. It says you're in control of your tongue. Only you can tame your tongue. And we must bridle our tongue lest our religion becomes useless. Are we getting that? Do you see how important this is? Don't be afraid to shake your head this way. Yeah, I get it. I get it. You're you're convicting me, Doug, but I get it. Doug's been there too. Doug has to bridle his tongue too. So this applies to every single one of us. It doesn't just apply to these Jewish Christians of the first century. It applies to all of us. He says, our tongue is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless God and the Father. Well, it's not an unruly evil when we're blessing God and the Father. Okay? It's doing what God wants it to do when we're doing that. But he says, with the same tongue, we curse men, which were made in the similitude of God. We speak against our fellow man. We speak against our brother or sister in Christ. Out of the same mouth proceeds blessings and cursings. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring send forth fresh water and bitter from the same opening? Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Thus no spring yields both salt and fresh water. Bridle your tongue, that it only speaks those things that are good, that glorifies God, that edifies your brother and sister in Christ. Never tear down one another, always build up one another. Never speak against each other, always speak in favor of one another. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct. That his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. He's not changing the subject. He's still talking about the tongue. He's just getting to the heart of the matter. How do you bridle your tongue? You know, it's kind of like Nicodemus. You must be born again. Okay, how do I do that? He's going to get to it. Who is wise in understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. 
Well, we've talked about that before, haven't we? In chapter 1. Are any of you lacking wisdom? What are we to do? Ask God. God is the source of wisdom. Wisdom comes from God through his word. Chapter 1, verse 5. Proverbs chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. Remember we read those? Only the meek and humble seek the wisdom of God. Matthew 7, verses 7 through 8. Knock, seek, ask. It will be open to you. It will be given to you. The meek realize it's not in me. I don't know what God wants me to do. The meek humbles themselves and says, I, I might have a feeling as what God wants me to do, but I dare not act upon my feelings. I must act upon what God has said. The meek seek the instruction of God, and that instruction is found in his word. But if any of you has bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, demonic. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. See, he hasn't stopped, stopped talking about bridling your tongue. Seek God's word. Seek his will. Bridle your tongue. Do not pursue envy and self-seeking. Why, why did Moses' uh, brother and sister say, well, why can't we be the, the leaders of the people? Does that sound like envy and self-seeking? See, this goes way back, and it's with us even yet today. This, this air quotes, this wisdom, not true wisdom, that comes from the carnal man. It's sensual. It's demonic. Your, your tongue sets on, the, on fire the course of what? Of hell. Where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. Have you ever experienced that? Somebody becomes envious or jealous of somebody else. They start speaking bad about that person to try to get you to, over to their way of thinking. And what happens? It's not going to be too long until you're going to be a, a congregation divided. You're going to be a family divided. You might be a husband and wife divided. You start speaking evil of one another to others. Matthew 12 and verse 35 says, Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. That's from Proverbs 4 and verse 23. The word of God made flesh is quoting himself there. In Proverbs 4 and verse 23. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So the tongue's bridle is his heart. Instead of being jealous and envious and self-seeking, we must be speaking well of others, supporting one another, and encouraging one another. If my heart is instructed rightly and I trust what God's word teaches me to do and I practice the self-control to speak the things and the way that God would have me to speak and not speak the way of hell, not speak the way of demons, I've put a bridle on my tongue. God is the one controlling the bridle when we practice the self-discipline. 
this, the wisdom that is from above is not earthly, sensual, and demonic. The wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality, without hypocrisy. That's what our heart has been instructed in a, to be our attitude towards one another as human beings and especially as brothers and sisters in Christ. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Be a peacemaker. Don't be a discord sower. Don't be envious and jealous and speaking bad about other people. Be a peacemaker. The fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers. They are the children of God. Be a peacemaker. We're going to get down there to, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? But I want you to notice here those first four verses. Because there is no chapter break. <laughs> you know, as James was writing this, he didn't say, oh, come here, well, let's put a chapter break here, let's change the subject. No, there's no change of subject here. The, the chapter break is, I think, unfortunate because the thought is still going. Where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from being envious and self-seeking that he was talking about up there earlier? You see that? Where, where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure? That war in your members, you lust and you do not have, you murder and you covet and you cannot obtain, you fight and you war, yet you do not have because you do not ask, you ask and you do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it in your own pleasures. If you're going to pray to God and ask God for something, don't, don't ask for something that you're going to use for yourself and selfishly. Ask for it to the glory of God. Ask for it that God will be glorified by it. But he says you ask and you don't receive because you ask for your own selfish reasons. You're all caught up in yourself. God is love. And God created us in his image. We are created to be love. Love is others focused. Love is not self focused. The common denominator of all sin is self. When you sin, you don't sin because you want to please God. You sin because you want to gratify the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. You want to participate in some momentary pleasure of sin, carnal pleasure. God created us to be others focused with the primary other being God. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Jesus said, John chapter 6 and verse 33. One thing is needed, Jesus told Martha. And Mary has chosen that good part that will not be taken from her. One thing is needed. And that is to live to the glory of God. And we can only do that in the way that God teaches us to do that. Adulterers and adulteresses. He's not charging them with all with committing carnal adultery. He's talking about spiritual adultery here. Oh, yeah, you, and, and that was the history of Israel, wasn't it? We can go back to the prophets, major and minor prophets, and we can see where God charged the nation of Israel with adultery. 
spiritual adultery, in worshiping idols. You need to understand that when they were worshiping idols, they did not consider themselves to have left Jehovah. They still went to the temple. They still claimed to be God's chosen people. They still claimed to be the, the Israel of God, God's children, and they, they were proud of that. But in addition to proclaiming themselves to be God's chosen people, they went up onto the high places and worshipped the idols. Spiritual adultery. Tried to be married to two religions at the same time. God said, I'm not playing that game. And that's what he's saying here. Why, don't you, why, are, why are you fighting among yourselves? It's not because you're trying to be a peacemaker. It's because you're trying to promote yourself. Trying to make yourself look better than somebody else. And in order to do that, you have to put somebody else down. You're not living for me. You might claim to be a follower of Christ, but I didn't teach you to do that. That's what God is saying. I didn't teach you to do that. You're not following Christ when you act that way. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Enmity, is that a word you use every day? Once a week? When was the last time you used that word enmity in a conversation? I don't know if I ever did, except when I was reading the Bible. <laughs> What's it mean? Hatred. Friendship with the world is hatred with God. What about you? Do you hate being like the world? Yeah, the world gets envious of each other. They're jealous of each other. They put their opposition down in order to raise themselves up. And it seems like they're kind of successful at it. Maybe that's what I ought to be doing too. That's what we'll start thinking, right? God hates it. And you know, you and I need to hate it too. We need to identify it, call it out when we see it, and snuff it out. Somebody comes to you gossiping about somebody else, snuff it out. They t Did you know this about this person? No, I didn't. Let's go talk to him about it. Let's see where that goes. If it's genuinely something wrong that they need to repent of, then you need to love them and, and confront them about it and encourage them to repent. But if this is just something that somebody's making up in order to make somebody look bad, you need to get to the bottom of that, too, for the sake of the gossiper to call them to repentance. Do you not know that living like the world and doing things the way the world does it is hatred with God? Whoever, therefore, wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. That's pretty strong language. You start acting like the world, you make yourself an enemy of God. God is one person you don't want to have as your enemy. If there's anybody you want on your side, it's God. Listen to him. Revere him. Practice his will. Do you think that the scriptures say in vain the spirit that dwells us yearns jealously? But he gives the more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. The proud will not seek the way of God. They are they're caught up in their way. They're proud of their attitude. 
and their opinion and what they think. It's the humble, it's the meek who will come to the word of God and say, Speak, Lord, your servant hears. I want to live for you and glorify you. He gives grace, he gives favor to the humble. Therefore, submit to God Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hand. We'll talk about that um, tomorrow night. Draw near to God. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy into gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. Speak, Lord. Your spirit... Your servant hears. Listen to what he says. Be resolved to do what he says, and he will lift you up. What did Jesus say? How did Jesus say it? I have come that you might have life, that you might have it more abundantly. When we hear God and we implant his word into our heart, and we begin performing the things that we know he wants us to do, we will have abundant life here, a fulfilled life here, an everlasting life in the presence of God and the heavenly host for eternity. I have come that you might have life, that you might have it more abundantly. Life is a good thing. Life is good. I've got a couple of those t-shirts. I like life. I like living. But life is, can be even more abundantly when we live it God's way instead of the world's way. Gratifying the lust of the flesh and lusty eyes and the pride of life. Do not speak evil one of another, brethren, he has not left the subject of bridling your tongue. Do not speak evil of one another, brethren. He who speaks evil of the law of a brother and judges his brother speaks evil of the law and judges the law. In Zechariah chapter 7 and verse 10 it says, Do not oppress the widow and the fatherless, the alien or the poor. James addressed that too didn't he, when, earlier this week when we were looking at it. Have, do not have the faith of God with partiality. And we saw how the, the Jew, Jewish Christians in the days that James wrote this letter were oppressing their fellow brothers and sisters in Christ financially. But here's the point we want to make tonight. Let none of you plan evil in his heart against his brother. New King James Version. The King James Version says, Let none of you imagine evil in your heart against your brother. I like them both. I like both translations. Because here's what's happened. And I've seen it happen. Somebody imagines that somebody has something against them. And then they begin to plan to do something against that person. When that person didn't do anything wrong in the first place. They just misinterpreted something that was said or something that was done. And they sowed discord among the brethren. Do not imagine evil in your heart against your brother. Well, that's Old Testament stuff, Doug. We're under the New Testament. Okay. Turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. You know what it says. This is where we talk about love and what love is and what it is not. 1 Corinthians 13 and verse 4, charity or love suffers long. Charity, love is kind. 
Love does not envy. It does not vaunt itself. It is not puffed up. It's not seeking attention, in other words. Love does not behave unseemingly. Love does not seek her own. Love is not easily provoked. Love does not think evil. Love does not imagine evil. Love does not assume evil. Love does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things. It believes all things. It looks for the best in all things. It hopes all things. It endures all things. Charity, love, never fails. Always do unto others as you would have them do unto you, as we talked about last night. Come now, you who say today or tomorrow we will go into such a city and spend a year there and buy and sell and make a profit, whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall do this, we shall live and do this or that. But now you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. You ever hear anybody boast in their arrogance? Sometimes you see sports figures boasting of how, how great they are. Sometimes you see political people boasting how great they are. Maybe they don't know any better, and I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt that they don't know any better, but you and I know better. Don't, don't adapt that pattern of speech for yourself about what you're going to do and what your abilities are because all such boasting is evil. Now, is it wrong to plan to do something? No. It's not wrong to make plans to do... Let, let's start a business and we'll go into this city and we'll, we'll uh, start a business and we'll make a profit and we'll live there and we'll contribute to the city and, you know, you've got big plans and big dreams and all that. Nothing wrong with that. But if you're boasting in your arrogance, this is what we're going to do. This is what we're going to do. Where's God in all that? Where's lifting up God? And when you've, when you've been successful in your business, are you lifting up God? Look at how God has blessed us. You see, that's what he's talking about. Don't be, boast about what you're going to do. Rejoice in what God has done in you and through you because you're following him. In Matthew 12 and verse 34, again, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. There's your bridle. There's your bridle. Here's your bridle. Put this in your heart. Let it control your life in what you do and what you don't do. In James 1, we go back to James 1 and verses 21 and 22. This is going to start, kind of start to be an anchor for us here. Lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Will you tonight receive the word of God? Don't let the word of God just be here in the Bible. Receive the word of God, implant it into your heart, into your mind, acknowledge it to be true, and practice it in your life. It is able to save your soul. Implant the word of God in your heart. It will change your character. It will bridle your tongue. It will save your your soul. Be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. If you're here tonight 
and you're not a Christian because you've never obeyed him. Jesus said, except you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? And if you answer in the affirmative to that, I will say, just like James said, that's good. So do the demons. The demons believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, but they do not serve him. They will not turn to him. They will not glorify him. What about your belief? Is your belief the same as that of the demons? You say, I, I believe Jesus is the Son of God. Are you going to obey him? Whatever God tells you to do, will you do it? Jesus said, except you repent, you will perish. Luke chapter 13, verse 3 and 5. Except you turn from your life to follow me, you will die in your sins. Confess me before men, and I'll confess you before my Father in heaven. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Mark 16 and verse 16. Will you do that? You said you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Will you do what he tells you to do? He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Ananias told Saul, why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. What about you? If you're here tonight and you're a child of God, you know you're out of favor with him, you need to make things right with him, don't wait. Say, well, I'll, I'll do it. What is your life? It's a vapor. You know, we're starting to see vapors come out of the exhaust of our cars now because it's gotten cold. How long does that vapor last? Not very long. How long are you going to live? Not very long. Are you going to live to, to pillow your head on your, in your bed tonight? You don't know. You don't know. You know, I held a gospel meeting at Wolf Creek years ago. Last night of the meeting. And there were some people there that were not in the favor of God. They needed to make things right with God. I don't know what their intention was when they left the building that night, but they were not right with God. And when they got to the first intersection, that car was T-boned, and they were killed. What is your life? If you know you're out of favor with God tonight, would you please make it right? Come to him. Humble yourself. Be meek. Be humble. Seek him. Would you come as we stand and sing this song?